Hello, welcome to the Big Idea webinar brought to you by Thinkers50 and Zevio. I'm Des Deal, I've co-founded with Thinkers50, the world's most reliable resource for identifying, ranking and sharing the leading management ideas of our age. Since 2001, we've been providing access to ideas with the power to make the world a better place. And that mission has never seemed quite so relevant or pressing. At Thinkers50, we believe that new ideas and fresh thinking will enable us to innovate our way out of the COVID crisis, to reboot our economies and get back to work and back to growth. We want to inspire you to seize this moment to create a better future for you and for your organisation. Now, our topic today is taming social media before it eats us alive. And I think we can all identify with that. Our guest speaker is Ben Pring. Ben is the head of thought leadership at Cognizant, where he co-founded and leads Cognizant Centre for the Future of Work. He's the co-author of the best-selling and award-winning books, What to Do When Machines Do Everything, and Code Halos, How the Digital Lives of People, Things and Organisations Are Changing the Rules of Business. His latest book, Monster, Taming the Machines That Rule Our Lives, Jobs and Future, will be out in early 2021. Now, Ben is also no stranger to Thinkers50. In 2019, he was shortlisted for the Thinkers50 Distinguished Achievement Award for Digital Thinking. And in 2020, he was named on the Thinkers50 radar as one of 30 management thinkers to watch. Ben, welcome. The format today is that we have 30 minutes. So Ben's gonna present for 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for a discussion. Ben, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much, Des. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation to speak and the opportunity. And uh, hi to everybody joining us today, either live or on demand. Let me just uh, transition over here and share my slides and we'll get going. Trust everyone can see that. You can see that, Des? Yep. Great. Thank yep. you. Good. Well, as, as Des says, I think we can all um, identify with this issue that we've got around social media, uh, something that's still in, obviously in human history, very new, a very recent phenomena, but something that's spread amongst us in incredible speed and velocity and intensity in the last 10, 15 years or so. And so I'm not gonna, in this short time that we have today, uh, make the case that we need to do something about this. I'm going to more focus on what we can do about it. And I'm not going to make the case that we should do this, um, do something about this, because I'm going to just assume <laughs> that when you're at a dinner party or out in a restaurant or out in the world and you see a situation like this, you kind of roll your eyes like I do. I'm going to assume that if you've got pair, uh, young children, up in their bedrooms of an evening that you're concerned about what's going on up there. I'm gonna assume that maybe you've had a similar experience to one I had uh, in 2019, back in the days when we could go on planes like this. I sat on a flight from Boston, where I live, to San Francisco, a six hour flight, and just watched sort of fascinated and horrified by this couple in front of me who spent the whole time staring at their phones and if you can just see in that little photo there, my own photo that I took, not a very good photo, you can see the head of a baby, a small baby, just standing there. And these parents just ignored this beautiful little baby for six hours. And I just sat there thinking, my God, what a world to be in where a kid, this most beautiful, precious gift that we have, is being brought up like this, staring up at its parents' face and just seeing this oblong, this black oblong in the way. I'm going to assume that you don't think that's good either. I'm going, I'm going to assume that you uh, share some of Jose Mourinho's bemusement. This is a picture he shared the other day of the changing room after a game when his team Spurs won at Burnley and the players all come into the changing room and immediately go on their phone. Of course, irony alert, he shared this, shared this on Instagram. But uh, this is Jose saying, this is kind of crazy. This is nuts. How do I build team spirit in this sort of world? I'm going to assume that you share my concern that all of this nonsense floating around on social media has had real impact on the way we govern ourselves. I'm going to assume 
that once you laugh at uh, deep fake videos like this, uh, and once you've perhaps enjoyed the new show from the South Park creators, Sassy Justice, where deep fakes are created to put words, improbable words into the, uh, the mouths of people who rule us. I'm going to assume that you've also thought through the consequences of when this begins to turn serious and we get past the joking and we realize that this deep fake kind of information which is being innovated at the moment could put really dangerous words into politicians which could flow around the internet, around social media at warp speed. And I'm reminded of the famous Ronald Reagan incident where he was caught on a hot mic saying the bombing begins in five minutes. He was saying it as a joke in a sound test. But imagine when that goes around the internet and it's not a joke anymore. I'm going to assume that you share my sense that all of the rage of the world, all of the rage that people are feeling because at its heart, we're all, many people are suffering from inequality of opportunity, inequality of, um, of, opportunity, of access to opportunity, that you have a sense like I do that that rage is captured in Thomas Piketty's famous equation. I'm going to assume that you share my sense that all of this rage in the world is being channeled through these machines which have become all the rage. I'm going to assume that you've seen Sasha Baron Cohen's video, his takedown of social media in 2019, and share many of the sentiments that he so eloquently expressed. I'm going to assume that you're following the cutting edge of this discussion and, and the fact that it isn't just old timers and parents like me, but it's young people on the cutting edge of contemporary culture, people like Matt Healy, the uh, lead singer songwriter of the 1975, one of the biggest bands in the world at the moment, who said this recently that you can see that this is tearing people apart. Uh, I'm gonna assume that you share that sentiment but I am going to make my argument that social media is a huge problem and something we need to do something about in a very personal way. By sharing with you something that I came across recently, uh, a college application letter. Here in the States where I live, uh, kids applying to university have to write uh, oftentimes a letter to supplement the uh, exam results, the, the grades, the test scores that they submit in their application for that college. And this was a, uh, a, a supplementary question that a very prestigious college in America asked recently. And I came across the response that a young person wrote to this very clever question. If you could advise policymakers on one action they could take to make the world a better place, what would it be? And I'm going to, if you'll indulge me, actually read the response to this question, because when I came across it, it really caught me short. It really stopped me in my tracks. I think it's quite profound. Cancel social media. Delete it from its, its existence. Facebook started a juggernaut that's plowing through my generation, destroying lives. Facebook and the other social media tools it heralded, Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok, have manipulated, deceived, and cannibalized the minds of my generation. It's had the fastest and uh, negative impact on the human race the world has ever seen. I, like hundreds, like 99% of your applicants this year, spend more time than any would admit scrolling through Instagram, Twitter, watching TikToks, and sending hundreds of Snapchats. It's what our generation does. I hate it, but being a Gen X, uh, Gen Y X, excuse me, it's impossible to get away from it. We were just innocent of the power it had over us, but our innocence would soon come to hurt us as we became addicted and unwittingly controlled by it. And it isn't just ask. Ask 10 people in your office to check their screen time summary for the week. Look at the time it sucked away, messing with your head, your mood, your sense of hope, distorting facts. Social media has created a profound addiction crisis, far worse than drugs, gambling, alcohol, and tobacco combined. It's caused a mental health crisis on an unprecedented scale. 
Social media apps have created a generation of kids with crippling body issues, with anxiety and depression. They've caused an epidemic of self-harm and shocking suicide rates, and it's taking bullying to a new level of intensity. These apps ruined my generation's childhood. We now walk into the adult world with our faces cast down, glued to our phones, not realizing what we are missing. I wish Mark Zuckerberg never created Facebook. I wish it would not have succeeded the way it did. I wish it didn't open the door to the addictiveness of these other apps. Most importantly, I wish that my generation could see the world through their own eyes, not through the eyes of their social media. I know the reality is that the genie won't go back in the bottle, but we have to regulate, control, educate, restrict, and stand up to this amorphous monster. Humanity depends on it. Put your phone away today. Look up. Now, as I say, when I came across that, I was really shocked. I was really moved by it. And I was particularly moved because, and you may have guessed already, that was actually written by my son, Noah. Uh, he wrote that completely <laughs> on his own. Uh, Parents of teenagers will know that teenagers don't really talk to their parents very much. This is not something I've coached him on or talked to him about particularly. Uh, he has been a guinea pig in an experiment and this is his view of his childhood. And as I say, that is just profoundly upsetting to me because look what he's saying, I hate it, but he's trapped as a Gen Wire in this new culture, he can't get away from it. He's talking about addiction crisis, about the problems that his generation have had with body issues, with anxiety and depression. And he's asking, he's pleading as a young person for adults to stand up to regulate, control, restrict this amorphous monster. Um, and I feel guilty. I feel personally guilty because here I am, a, a tech evangelist, somebody who for the last 35 years has been going around the world extolling the benefits of technology and in the last 15 years or so talking about the upside of a lot of this new uh, smack based technology a phrase that we came up with social mobile analytics and cloud again irony alert talking about smack we've been talking about the upsides of this and privately I've been saying to my wife don't worry it's going to be okay uh, overriding her concerns that we were dealing with something that we didn't really understand. And here I feel today in 2020, like I'm truly guilty of that. I truly feel like we don't know what we have done in allowing these incredibly powerful tools and technologies into the hands of our innocent children who clearly can't handle this. So the question is, once we've made this argument, and once we've realized we've got a problem, how do we tame this monster? And that's where we got the, the inspiration for the, the, the book that Des mentioned that's coming out next year. And how do we reclaim some control over this rather than allow ourselves to, eat, to be eaten alive by it? And in the book, we're proposing lots of different ideas, far too many to go into in this short session. Uh, one is establishing a federal technology administration akin to the FDA that regulates food and drugs. We're talking about a data authority to regulate data. We're talking about legislation in data ownership and portability. We're talking about audit legislation of algorithms. We're talking about banning social uh, media political advertising. We're talking about repealing Section 230. We're talking about uh, laws to protect data coming into a sovereign area from outside. We're talking about the whole problem of anonymity on social media. Lots and lots of different ideas that we've got, which are going to be needed to tackle this extraordinarily big problem we've got uh, that we've created with, with this incredibly powerful technology. But in this session and in this big idea session, I'm gonna share simply one idea uh, with you today, predicated on the notion that we need to introduce age limits for people to use social media. Put bluntly, we need to prohibit 
the use of social media by people under the age of 18. Because think about it, we don't let young people too immature, too naive, to get behind the wheel of an incredible machine like this until they reach a certain age threshold. We don't allow young people access to alcohol for the same reason, to tobacco for the same reason. We don't allow young people to get married until they're mature enough to handle that. We don't allow young people to go in the army until they're old enough to handle it. We don't allow people access to guns until they're old enough to handle it. Again, irony alert there. We don't allow people to vote here in the, in the States a couple of days ago. You have to reach a certain age limit to be able to do that. But we allow anybody, any young kid, any immature kid, access to these incredible machines, these incredible powerful machines. And we're sort of surprised now what's happened. We're surprised about bullying. We're surprised about addiction. We're surprised that these young, innocent minds are being corrupted by so much that they see and experience and create on these incredibly powerful, deliberately designed to be addictive platforms. Uh, and I think as a corollary of this idea of having an age limit to use these apps and these tools, we should take our, again, our inspiration from the fact that to, to get behind the wheel of a car, uh, you have to have a license to do that. We, don't, we, we uh, make young people go through training, education, and then we ask them to pass a test before they can get behind the wheel of a car. And then that license is revocable if they, uh, if they don't do that correctly. Uh, and I think, again, we could take inspiration from that and we realize actually that is bubbling up in schools around the world. In, in my school district here in Massachusetts, there is now beginning to be rudimentary education about how to use these tools sensibly in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an appropriate way. And I think all of this ad hoc um, initiatives that are bubbling up around the world, I think we can begin to take those, hardwire them, uh, stress test them, institutionalize them, and ultimately make them law. So, if you followed the argument so far, you may be agreeing with me, uh, and we're going to get into some questions in a moment, maybe some of you are disagreeing with me, but I'm sure where many of your heads have gone are, well, okay, I get it, but, but how do we do this? And I've got a simple response to that, which is that the technologies that we use, and we've become very, you know, uh, very comfortable with in the last few years, the technologies themselves that have created this problem can be used to solve this problem. We've, we're using fingerprint recognition, fa facial recognition now. We've got incredibly powerful algorithms that are driving the addiction within these uh, applications. We can turn those uh, in a jujitsu move to actually regulate the use of the app in the first place. So I don't think it's a technological issue that we can't solve. I think it's simply the question of having a will to do this. This is the Greek symbol for the phrase, where there's a will, there's a way. I think this is simply a question of will. And I think one of the, the key learnings, again, we on the leading edge of technology uh, are coming to appreciate and again, this is something that we write about extensively in our book, is that we can't just stand off in a laissez-faire way around the edge of technology and allow technology to continue to develop in a completely unregulated, unmanaged way. Uh, we sort of have done this in the last 25 years. It's been part of the heart of the success of the growth of technology, but we're also now beginning to see the downsides of that. So I think we're at this important crossroads where if we can manage and tame this type of technology, we can leverage the unquestionable, undeniable upside of all of this. I'm not against social media. I, I spend a lot of time on it myself and use it, but completely unregulated, completely unmanaged, completely left in the hands of people too young and immature to use it. I think we've got a huge problem. 
And just to frame this out finally in one big meta thought, um, I put this into the context of how we've regulated and managed other technologies in history. This is a picture of Kensington High Street in West London in 1928. And you can see lots of cars there on the road because cars have been around for 20 or 30 years by this time. But if you uh, stare closely, kind of uh, glint at this closely, you can see there's no road markings, there's no stop signs, there's no traffic lights. There's none of the architecture of the road that in a generation or two's time beyond that, we now take for normal, we take for granted to keep us safe on the road. None of that exists in that picture there. And I think that's the metaphor that we can assume going forward, we need to keep to the forefront of our mind that we've created this information superhighway in Al Gore's famous phrase, but on the internet, in social media, there's no yellow, uh, no parking signs, there's no road markers, there's no traffic lights, there's no give way signs, there's no yield signs, there's no roundabouts, no rotaries. I think that's the opportunity and the challenge ahead of us in the next few years to put in place that architecture of safety that we take for granted on the physical roads, put that in place uh, in this new information virtual road that we all live on and we all travel in. So my idea, the idea in our book is very simple. The notion of having age uh, limit, introducing an age limit to keep young people out of this so they don't use these powerful technologies before they're ready to, and they don't bring the, uh, the uh, behaviors of the schoolyard, the behaviors of young children into the real world, which I think, again, we can all agree is what we're really seeing with bullying and terrible behavior on social media at the moment. Um, this notion I know is perhaps controversial. It's, it's gonna be difficult. I, I don't, uh, don't disagree with that for a moment. I don't believe it's gonna be simple to do this, but I do think it's a first step for all of us uh, in changing the conversation and changing our perspective about how we think about social media technology. And um, as I mentioned, it's uh, a lot more <laughs> to be said on this in our, in our new book coming out in uh, March, 2021. So I'll pause there, Des, and um, thank everybody for their time and attention and interest. And uh, maybe we've got time for a, a question or two. Ben, that was really thought provoking um, and so timely, um, not least with what's going on on your side of the water in America at the moment and what's likely to unfold <laughs> over the next um, few days and possibly weeks. Um, I don't want to get too far into the politics, but um, what I what struck me very forcefully as you were speaking is, is the notion that, that young, a lot of young people don't want this. A lot of people don't want this. Um, there's a, a, a really good piece in The Economist um, at the weekend and uh, talking about um, obviously about social media and talking about you know who controls the conversation is the was the headline, and they they got some fascinating statistics because they said a tenth of Americans think social media are beneficial. So a tenth, ten percent. Mm -hmm. We think of social media as you know it's this wonderful democratizing thing, but actually if only ten percent think it think it's beneficial, two thirds in America think that social media causes harm. Mm -hmm. Um, since February, YouTube has identified over 200,000 dangerous or misleading videos on COVID-19. I mean, my mm. point being, if, if we're in a democracy, if we're in a, a, a democratic situation and two thirds of the people don't want it or think it does harm and only 10% do, it's not a democratizing thing then, is it? I mean, it, it's, it's crazy that we carry on as we do. Sorry, that was a long-winded question to say, <laughs> I think we got the idea social media was supposed to be democratizing, but in fact, it, it may be anti. Yeah, no, I completely agree, Des, and, and thank you for reading out those additional um, stats and, and, and facts. I, I totally agree. I, I, I think the notion that um, we're allowing this technology and the people who are leveraging it to have this control, this dominance, 
over us, over people of goodwill, people of good faith, reasonable, um, moderate people. Again, this is the craziness, this is the insanity that we've unleashed. And again, why I think, you know, perhaps this is a little bit too strong. And I, you know, I certainly put um, quotation marks about this. I'm, I'm reminded of the, the famous phrase, you know, all it takes for evil to flourish is for good people to do nothing. That's why I think it's important for good people like us to do something about this. That's why I think people like me in a position of, you know, some influence as a technology, technology evangelist, we have to step forward into this because ultimately, you know, I work in a technology company. I love technology. I've made my whole career in technology. I completely understand the positive power. I completely believe in the sense that technology has been central to the creation of wealth and opportunity and, and making the world better for billions of people around the world. But if we allow this poison in the well to, to, to ruin the well for us all, I think we've got a short-term problem. And I think, uh, paraphrasing what Mark Benioff has said about social media in the last few years is that um, uh, th this is the new cigarettes yeah. And I don't want to be seen in another generation's time as a cigarette executive is regarded nowadays. Yeah, absolutely, and I and I agree. I think I think I think the uh, drawing the parallel with gambling and with alcohol and with uh, with tobacco it, it is a is a very stark one. And it, the remarkable thing is that, that that we don't see that parallel being made more often. Listen, we're streaming this, so I think this is going to kick off a, a lot of questions and a lot of interest. So, people out there, if you've got questions for Ben please tweet them to at thinkers50 and we will try to, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but I, I think this is, some, this is a conversation that might run for a while. So please do send us your questions. We will put them to Ben and I'm sure he will, he will do his very best to reply to them as well. Um, where, where are you on, on you know, the responsibility of the tech companies? Um, do you have got any comment on the fact that some social media channels are more committed to doing fact checks for political content and ads perhaps now um you know obviously twitter briefly restricted trump's campaign account and some of the inflammatory remarks um you know at the end of the you know the early stages of the counting of votes uh did appear to be um at least given some sort of a warning yeah no i i think this is obviously a crucial issue des and and i, I do think that the social media companies need to be more, much more proactive in this and to be seen to be much more proactive uh, with all of this. And of course, it's very complicated. I fully accept that, fully understand that. And issues of free speech in America are particularly hot, uh, clearly in this very kind of febrile political environment. I completely understand this. But the notion that those, those organizations and, and, and people in those organizations can really just not want to do anything about it, not want to engage with this in a meaningful material way, I think is a problem. And I think those organizations need to be stepping forward. Uh, and again, I think if you just put it in the context of, um, if they don't, they will be regulated probably in the next generation, the rules of the road will emerge in that metaphor I use in a way that will probably be negative for them. So I think they have an incentive and I think to be fair to them, people like Mark Zuckerberg and others in, in those types of organizations have said, you know, we want to be regulated. I didn't put this slide in there, but just another ir irony alert slide. I think another aspect of age limits is that a lot of people in, in the, the American political world are too old <laughs> to really understand this. Maybe we need a age limit on the upper side as well as the lower side. So we have people who are making the rules of the road, the rules of this game, who kind of understand it. Uh, the famous quote, well, you know. And, and, and fascinating, fascinating implications for the, for the next president in, in terms of um, age and things. Anyway, we can't go there. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but yeah. I, I should have known half an hour wasn't long enough to, to have this conversation. I really hope we get a chance to rerun this because I do think we're going to get a lot of questions. And I just think it's, 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 probably the most important or certainly one of the most important topics um, around at the moment. So, so Ben, um, thank you for that. It was absolutely fascinating. And I, and I do really look forward to the new book. 
Um, if you want to get in touch with Ben, he's at the Cognizant Centre for the Future of Work. Um, on behalf of Thinkers50 and Zevio, thank you all for tuning in. Please join us next time for more fresh thinking with the Big Idea webinar. I'm Des Dearlove. Goodbye. <laughs>